Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday, May 11, Sioux Falls City Council meeting. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll go ahead and get started, Denise, by reading our roll. Council members Neitzer? Here. Selberg? Here. Sale? Here. Starr? Here. Brecky? Here. Erickson? Here. Jensen? Here. Kylie? Here. All right, with us tonight to give our invocation is uh, Pastor Randall Gearing from Our Saviors Lutheran. Thanks for coming back, Randy. We appreciate you being here, so I'd ask that you stand for his invocation and then stay standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mayor. Today has come to this. Whatever else this day has been, whatever else this day has brought, we now find ourselves together in these chambers, in this moment. The result of a confluence of forces and circumstances none of us can quite fully explain. And this moment, like every other one we've experienced today, or any other day for that matter, is a gift, a blessing from our gracious creator. So I invite you all to take a good deep breath and breathe in the gift God is giving you. Be present in this time in ways that bring the very best version of yourself to bear on the agenda that is before you. See in one another a reflection of the image of God and treat each other accordingly. Offer yourselves and the gifts God has bestowed upon you in service to this community and its citizens, striving always for peace, justice, and for the common good. So again, take a good deep breath and rest, if only for a moment, in the gift of this time together and in the assurance that you are not alone in this important work. Let's pray. God, whose giving knows no ending, let your spirit rest upon these chambers this night and upon these leaders whom you have called to serve this city and all who live here. Bless them with wisdom, patience, foresight, and vision, and guide them in their deliberating and in their decision-making. We pray this humbly, trusting in your goodness and relying upon your grace, and we pray it thankfully, mindful of the abundance of your blessings. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll have a couple special presentations up front. I believe Councillor Neitzer can join me up front. Thank you. It's my pleasure at this time to give a little speech for Councillor Greg Neitzer, who served as our chair this last year. And I will say it's been a very trying year for somebody to be in leadership like he's been. And I've learned a lot from his example of leadership and communication. But I will tell you this in regards to communication, it's really difficult for anybody to follow your extensive postgraduate dissertations and the length of your emails, Greg. <laughs> But in all seriousness, thanks for your service and an appreciation for your leadership. I'm honored to present you with this gavel, which is inscribed in recognition of Councilor Greg Neitzer for his service and leadership as Chair of the City Council 2020-2021.
right. Now we have a special presentation for our um, annual beautification awards. And I'm going to invite Sean Irvin up. There he is. Um, we have a presentation to go through on these awards. Uh, Sean is the chair uh, of our uh, beautification uh, committee. We'll get this up. And he will advance those while uh, I believe Denise will kind of read... Uh, the nominees and the winners. So we'll get started. All right. Before we start, can the members of Sioux Falls Beautiful that have joined us today stand? Thank you for being here, ladies. Sioux Falls Beautiful would like to present the 2020 Beautification Awards. They are an organization that works to promote projects and supporters of a beautiful city. They are both advocate and resource to those who would like to achieve the same ends. Now, they also coordinate a grant program to help financially support the projects that have the most merit through a matching challenge. These awards recognize exceptional projects that impact their environment and contribute to the beautiful places of Sioux Falls. Their nomination process is open to the public and posted online on the city's website as well as their Facebook page. They encourage everyone to watch for exceptional projects and yards to nominate this summer and fall. Of course, they encourage everyone to make the effort to make your own yard beautiful places as we step into mm -hmm. spring. They have three mm -hmm. awards for 2020. The first mm -hmm. is... Augustana Outdoor Classroom Beautification Award, which will be accepted by Professor Dr. David O'Hara, Professor, Chair, and Director of Sustainability. Nestled between mature trees, the campus green, and university buildings, the new outdoor classroom was instantly a welcomed feature of the Augustana grounds. A series of hand-laid stones crafted by staff and students create a small amphitheater where students and instructors can have meaningful dialogue while enjoying beautiful weather and an idyllic environment. It has been well utilized during concerns about exposure to the recent pandemic and has become a celebrated space for many. This feature proves that the beauty of a place is not limited to only flowers and plants, but can also be created by an element that is designed to be part of the land and make a special home for an important function. Their second award is a residential yard. The Dr. Craig and Dr. Suzanne Spencer Residence Beautification Award will be accepted by the owners Craig and Susie Spencer of 2504 South 6th Avenue. He is a biology professor and ecologist. She is a retired physician. Ten years ago, they began converting their Kentucky bluegrass lawn to South Dakota's drought-tolerant native prairie grasses and flowering plants, the Forbes. They did so to eliminate demand for high water use, the herbicide and pesticide applications that might run off to the river and the mowing. Native plants also store carbon and contribute to building the rich topsoil of eastern South Dakota. Kentucky bluegrass does not. The native plants and landscapes have been a joy and labor of love ever since. After 10 years, plants increase naturally, and Craig and Susie give away hundreds of plants a year. It is gorgeous all year round with color, texture, and added benefit of wildlife as goldfinches feed from the stems. There is a steady progression of forbs, flowering plants like pask, prairie smoke, butterfly weed, purple cone flowers, and fall blue gent gentian against a backdrop of spectacular tall grasses, big and little blue stem, and Indian grass. The Spencers hope to inspire others with their yard of natural beauty. They would love to have you drive by this summer to see it.
<laughs> and their final award this year is the Augustana Froyland Science Center Complex Beautification Award, which will be accepted by Andrea Smith, Augustana Director of Facility Services. Located at the southeast corner of Augustana University, Froyland Science Complex is a primary public gateway to campus. Administration, faculty, and facility staff were closely involved in the design process with a goal of creating an outdoor laboratory with prairie, oak savanna, and woodland themed gardens to support biology research and classes. A diverse, a diverse selection of native trees, shrubs, grasses, and forms provide an educational feature which was not previously available on this central Sioux Falls campus. A crushed stone pathway provides access to enjoy and study the plantings as well as an alternative pedestrian route to the public sidewalk, which is located adjacent to a busy city street. A courtyard between the existing science center and new addition includes flexible space, large enough to hold outdoor classes and even receptions. Private study spaces were created within the courtyard through the placement of burned planting beds and quartzite stone boulders. All right, thank you, Denise, for reading those awards. Thank you to Sean Irvin for uh, chairing our beautification committee, and congratulations to those award winners. Uh, some beautiful projects there. So we appreciate the work you're doing to make our city uh, beautiful and sustainable. So with that, we will uh, keep moving forward with our agenda, and that brings us to item five, which is our consent agenda. Look for uh, any changes or motions there. Move approval. Second, Jensen. Okay, motion by Selberg, seconded by Jensen. Is there any discussion on that motion? All right, hearing none, let's take a vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. We'll move on to our regular agenda. Uh, that's item 12. Look for a motion there. Move to approve, Kylie. Second, Jensen. Motion by Kylie, seconded by Jensen to approve our regular agenda. Any discussion on that motion? All right, hearing none, let's take a vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Before we continue on, I just want to review public input for our agenda items tonight. For regular agenda items, comments are limited to three minutes, unless the item is being presented for final adoption, in which case public input is limited to five minutes per person. For all regular agenda items, comments are limited to the agenda item under consideration only. And during general public input at the end of the meeting, comments will be limited to no more than three minutes per person. So. We'll go ahead and get started with uh, item 13, please. Second reading deferred from the meeting of Tuesday, May 4th, 2021, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota rezoning property located south of East 41st Street and east of South Six Mile Road from the AG Agriculture District to the LW Live Work RD2 Townhome Residential Suburban and RS Single Family Residential Suburban Districts number 13946 2021 and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. The planning commission recommends approval six to zero. Private applicants 416 LLC Brady Hyde. Councilor Jensen. Mr. Mayor I'm recusing myself for items 13 and 14 pursuant to city ordinance 30.017. Thank you. All right you're recused. All right Jason good evening. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council. Uh, Jason Bieber representing Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is an application by Brady Hyde with Empire Homes. Uh, it's located at the southeast corner of East 41st Street and South Six Mile Road. It's just under 50 acres in size. 
the purpose of this rezoning is the applicant is looking at constructing a residential development with some apartments in the live work zoning district, some townhomes in the RD2, and then some single family residential uses on the south. Uh, the applicant uh, will improve the existing six mile road. Currently it is um, gravel. They will approve it with a roll section, so pave one side of that street. And they will pave it from 41st Street all the way down to the first access point on 44th Street. Uh, the applicant indicated that his phase one will be uh, constructing 44th Street all the way over and then constru constructing the first uh, leg of 10 Kate Avenue. Um, doing uh, a couple of the fourplex unit lots and then some of the single family. Uh, he has indicated that the uh, live work portion will be done in the next couple of years. That, that will be a, a farther phase down the line. As we look at our Shape Sioux Falls uh, 2040 comprehensive plan, you notice that this intersection of 41st and, and 6 Mile Road is classified as a neighborhood employment center. Uh, that employment center within uh, the comprehensive plan does include commercial office and multifamily residential uses. Uh, the applicant's proposal does meet uh, the requirements of this neighborhood employment center, and he's also providing the transitions that we typically like to see uh, in these kind of developments with the apartments adjacent to the heavier trafficked arterial streets, and then transitioning to townhomes as you go east, and then finally single family um, as you go south. Uh, to the outskirts of the development. Uh, we do have uh, Shannon Austin from Traffic Engineering here if there's any more detailed traffic questions that we need. I know the applicant is here and there's also several neighbors from that existing rural subdivision to the northeast that are here also, so. All right, thanks Jason. Okay, is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this item? You can come on and come up at this time. Just first come, first serve, so. Good evening, sir. All right, uh, Mayor, members of the council, thanks again for having me back to speak. Um, my name is Chris Volsky and I live on Matt Road. Uh, as you already know, we had a neighborhood meeting with Jason from City Planning, Shannon from Traffic Engineering, and the developer Brady. Uh, we had a significant turnout. We actually had over 50 neighbors that came to that. Uh, we did learn a few things, um, namely that the Pine Hills neighborhood wasn't necessarily factored into any of the prior decision making. For example, we heard much testimony from Jason and Shannon around the corner of 41st and 6 Mile being a neighborhood employment center, as we just heard. With the city of Sioux Falls classification of those two streets, they feel the mixed use residential retail in that higher density population is appropriate. However, it was also made clear that the yellow dots as we just saw in that 2040 shape plan would be present for any such intersection as long as those roads met that criteria. So whether that was an empty, undeveloped land, or in our case, has 100 acres of rural residential, it really makes no difference. The designation was going to be for that yellow dot without any regard for our neighborhood, which was platted over 50 years ago. Of course, they also had no time frame of when the city would improve 41st Street to the east, and rather that it would stay gravel, even with the increased traffic, until they deemed it necessary and had adequate funding. Now, my thoughts on this is that for all intents and purposes, 41st Street ends as an arterial road, at six mile. Um, Shannon verified there is no plan right now to take 41st across the river. Uh, she did st instead state the city's long-term plan is to connect 57th across the river, which I did find interesting to the south of us. So while I can't imagine they will ever drastically improve 41st, means it won't be a through street, and you would also have to account for the roller coaster hill that leads down to the game fish and parks youth walk-in hunting area that is right next to the floodplain down there. As such, how can it truly be classified as arterial if it never develops into an arterial. Let's be realistic. With the constrained infrastructure budget, the city isn't building a seven lane road to the game, fish, and parks hunting area. Essentially, 41st and 6 Mile is about the end of the line for development if you go straight east. Rather, that growth is going to be to the south of us along that 57th Street corridor. Moving on, the developer hasn't taken our rural residential into any type of consideration. He actually admitted that other than driving 41st Street, he has never even visited Pine Hills, despite the fact he's building 50 acres directly to the south of us. That, in my mind, solidified that all his decisions being made are without regard for our neighborhood. Really, the meeting was dictating to us why this development is allowed to the, toward, because of the 2040 plan, and not a single compromise or concession was even considered. What I thought was a relatively small ask, just some simple landscape buffering between the live work development and Dan Anderson's family property fell on deaf ears. The developer told us if it's not required by the city code, it's not gonna be done. 
Um, even when the developer stated the proposed size of his multifamily units, um, he was careful to add anything at the, on the final plan would be market needs. So I cautioned everyone in the neighborhood to make sure they understand that market needs when you're building that live work three years down the road could be retail, could be gas station, could be a used car lot as we found out, uh, could be a restaurant and bar. It, the possibilities are endless for what the market may need in three years from now. I should also point out the developer believes this may be a bit of a rubber stamp. Um, in a show of force, apparently, he decided to move all the bulldozers to the property this morning before we even had a chance to vote on this. I believe the neighborhood is unified in the fact that we understand those 50 acres will be developed. The trigger issue instead for most of us is that the proposed population density with the apartments and the related traffic. Personally, I still feel the best use for that land is single family housing. All city leaders are talking about is the lack of inventory. We heard that during the state of the city. Even more so, the lack of first time home buyer properties. This could be a unique opportunity to build out a neighborhood of single family residential that fills the most pressing need for the city with a developer that is already planning on building entry level houses while simultaneously respecting the rural residential neighborhood that was platted and established over a half century ago by the Anderson family. As I close, I would refresh the council's memory as to their own records. I have right here a copy of the annexation request with the petition date of September 16th, 2020. We're gonna to flip to the second page, which is the planning comments. And I would point out that the planning comments state, area is in tier two, annexation is not advised. City services are not projected to be available for six to 15 years, additional monetary resources are needed. Yet with that, the council decided to vote eight to zero for annexation. Clearly the lack of city services is creating an issue. I encourage you to listen closely to the concerns of all of our Pine Hills neighborhood here tonight. I think it can be rethought, reimagined, and maybe have some good faith compromises. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. Come on up, ma'am. You can hold. You guys can hold your applause too until we're all done here tonight. Thank you. Go Good ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Glenn. I live by 41st Street and Bingham Avenue. Um, I second everything that my neighbor Chris mentioned. Um, we live in the Pine Hills development. We love our quiet rural neighborhood. We're realistic. We know that change has to come. Um, we are just asking for your help to preserve our neighborhood. We are an established mature neighborhood with single family homes. We would like the 10 case rezoning by 41st Street and Six Mile Road to be all single family residential with no live work or RD2 rezoning. The city needs additional options for single family homes. This helps people achieve the American dream of home ownership. This also enhances and grows our city in a positive way. Live work and RD2 doesn't make sense right across the street from one to two acre lots in a rural setting with single family homes. Live work and RD2 rezoning would drastically and forever alter our neighborhood. Our beautiful valley should be full of like-minded homes. Our concern is increased traffic. I live on Bingham Avenue. Right now, our road is considered a development road and is not maintained by the county. Myself and the other um, neighbors down the street, we all pitch in every year. We buy our own gravel, rocks, dirt, and we put it down on our road and maintain it ourselves. Um, Matt Road is also this way. It is one street over. With the increased traffic, if we're already maintaining that, we already don't have any help. So where is additional help going to come from? Another concern, it seems like decisions are being made regarding profits or what's better for the developer instead of what's actually best for our neighborhood or the land itself. Last week, the developer, Brady Hyde, admitted he has not even driven through our neighborhood to check it out and see what it's like in that surrounding area. That's very disappointing. This shows his lack of interest, concern, knowledge, or even flexibility to work with us. Please help us keep the beauty of our slow-paced rural neighborhood by not allowing live work or RD2 rezoning. Please preserve our neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Come on up, sir. You bet. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Tim Lundeen, uh, Air Force retired. Um, I'll make this quick. Uh, I'd like to thank the folks that already spoke, but I have a little more macro view of, of things. Um, there's about 100 homes in our development, um, modest 
for the most part, structures on one acre lots. And I think I can speak for a lot of people here in that we aren't there for exclusivity. We were there for a little elbow room and a little privacy. Um, we are not against progress. So from that standpoint, we were, uh, took some comfort in the verbiage in the planning documents that uh, any new development would be consistent with existing development. So imagine our surprise when we saw what was in the planning documents for this particular project. Um, it just didn't look like our neighborhood. So um, what my suggestion is, is when you're making your decision tonight, my suggestion is put this project on hold and send your planners back to consult with us so we can find something that's a little bit more um, consistent with the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your service. Anyone else here to speak on this item? Come on up. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. You bet. Uh, I just want to read a couple can things. I, can I get your name, sir? Virgil Stenzel. Virgil, all right. I live on East 41st Street. I just want to read a couple things from the Shape Sioux Falls uh, document. Uh, under goals, um, uh, objective 1B, protect the character of the surrounding rural area and other communities in the region. And then down a little farther, objective 2B, achieve an arrangement of activities which promotes harmonious interaction among the various elements of the community and it minimizes land use conflicts. You can interpret that probably nine different ways. But, you know, just think about that when you think about this project. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Virgil. Anyone else here to speak tonight? Come on up. Good evening, ma'am. I'm Vicki Anderson. I Feel free to tug on those mics there, what? Vicki. You, you can tug on those mics, oh. pull them down a little bit. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yeah, I'm a little short. Okay, so I am Vicki Anderson. I live at 7800 East 41st Street, which is directly across from the development that's being proposed. Um, I, too, want to reiterate a few of the, com or the comments that are made within the shaping places zoning or document. First of all, within shape places zoning, there is the goal of preserving and protecting the existing property use, which I truly feel has not been adhered to. Um, live work allows too great of latitude with clearly no documented commitment from Empire Homes. Um, city statement that they are not able to impede the developer from maximizing financial gain while negatively impacting existing residents. Lives and land values goes against every intent of the shaping Sioux Falls 2040 goals. It was suggested that we take a look at that document. I did, I read all the pages. Um, there are multiple sections that I feel uh, within the shaping Sioux Falls 2040 document that are not being adhered to by city planning nor the city council. Um, at our neighborhood meeting, there were, as we indicated, about 50 concerned citizens. Um, it is unfortunate that there were no members there. We did invite them. Um, there was no response to my last email indicating um, things that were discussed and requesting additional information. There were questions that were left unanswered at this point. I'm very surprised at the limited knowledge of the city planning office and Empire Homes related to the school district, the joining land, which has granted underneath of it, the Pine Hill neighborhood itself, the single lane bridge on Six Mile Road and the existing traffic pattern that we have a great deal of concerns about and we feel is unacceptable. The annexation notes were already brought up, so I won't go over that again. Uh, the map indicated that it is the area is a tier two development and indicated annexation is not advised due to the projections for city services. Um, yet the annexation went through. In addition, there was no notification at all to the landowners in close proximity and uh, when that proposed annexation happened, um, exactly how is that allowed, allowed? I assume there was some sort of notification, especially, especially to someone who is directly adjacent to that property. The create compatibility section of the Shape Sioux Falls also indicates that there is potential incompatibility between single family residential and apartment residential. 
This is exactly what we have in this situation, and this is where we're looking for some consideration and some compromise. Um, it appears that the city is moving forward with no consideration to the single family residents that are in the area. Um, the statement that 41st Street is an arterial road is a bit of an exaggeration. The Shapes Corridor map shows East 41st Street as a limited use arterial road ending at Riverview Avenue or even before that and no intended improvements in the near future and as far out as 2045 as was indicated. Um, this does not make as was indicated in the planning um, meeting a four to seven lane arterial road that would be a buffer against proposed development from the existing Pine Hill residence which is directly across would be us. <laughs> Again the city is moving against the intent and goals of the Shapes Sioux Falls 2040 document. I mean, to summarize, I really feel, we feel that the city of Sioux Falls is not adhering to its own shaping Sioux Falls principles and goals in this situation. Based on comments that were made, it appears that there is more weight placed on the ability of Empire Homes to recoup a larger portion of their investment rather than the rights of the neighborhood that has been in existence for 50 years. As residents within the three mile radius of Sioux Falls, I would assume that we have been afforded, we would be afforded the same consideration as the residents themselves of Sioux Falls. There has been no compromise in the situation, rather basically a statement that the residents of Pine Hills will need to adjust to the city's boundary push, whether they are negatively impacted or not. Hopefully you have listened to the numerous concerns that have been addressed. We have raised those both verbally and written and that you seriously consider the negative impact and the concerns that have raised. As I indicated, there are still unanswered questions. Um, we are very concerned about the situation that we have at hand, and we hope that we can reach some sort of a compromise. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Scott Ayers from Sioux Falls. I don't live in this neighborhood, and I really don't know the developer doing this, but this is a classic example of developers, contractors, and big business funding the council. So the council turns around and gives them what they want. And they're gonna do it again tonight. I feel sorry for your people. You're not gonna win. They're gonna have all kinds of fun excuses as to why we need to do this. And it doesn't really matter what you were told several years ago about what was gonna be there. They don't care. They don't care about you. You don't pay their um, campaigns. You don't give money to their campaigns. The big developers and big businessmen do. The big bankers in town fill their chests full of thousands and thousands of dollars. There was one uh, counselor who raised over $120,000. Do you think that came from little guys that come up here to the podium to talk about their neighborhoods? No. Now that comes from the big banksters in town. And some of them even worked for them and probably should have recused themselves from this vote tonight. But that's a whole other story. One of the person that came up, spoke, said it the best. Make it more of a neighborhood. Build more houses. That's what it is now. We have no affordable housing. We don't have any plans on trying to invest in affordable housing. Instead, we give a $94 million TIF to a Korean egg roll factory. I don't know where these people are going to live that are going to work there. I don't know where these people are going to come from to work there. There's 10,000 employment listings in Sioux Falls currently. Where are these people going to live? In tents? This is what happens when you have a city council and a city government that is not transparent and only cares about big business and big development. They don't care about you, and they haven't for a long, long time. If they did, they'd be spending $94 million on infrastructure, upgrading your neighborhood with streets for more single-family homes. But they're not doing that. Of course they're not. The regular old taxpayer, Joe, who makes $15 an hour at the egg roll factory, doesn't fund their campaigns. So, he doesn't get what he wants. He has to pay taxes. Did you, I had a, there was a mayoral candidate a few years back, Janak Adja, 
God rest his soul. He got mad once because at a forum, a mayoral forum, someone brought up the fact that we shouldn't care about homeless people or poor people because they don't pay any taxes. Well, guess what? They do pay taxes. You pay sales taxes. You pay property taxes. You pay all kinds of taxes, but it doesn't ever seem to come back at you. Developers come up here. They get to build whatever they want you next to your house. They get massive tax breaks, tax rebates, federal subsidies, PPP grants. It's just like the checks are flying through the air for them. And while you worked your butt off to pay a 30-year mortgage on your dream home on where you're at, it doesn't matter to these people because you didn't donate to their campaign. So guess what? They're going to vote you down tonight. It might get a close tie, but I doubt it. And I don't want you to be surprised. And I don't want you to cry over it because it's not worth crying over. I've gotten over it a long time ago. Anyone else here to speak tonight? Come on up. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. I'm Rosa Lundine, and I live on Tim Trail. Could you and say your name again? I didn't catch that. Rosa Rose. Lundine. Rosa, all right. And Rosa. I live on Tim Trail. And I just have a couple of comments. First of all, I agree with the neighbors who have spoken. Um, I agree with the concept that I think that single-family homes are the best way to go. The developer and Jason told us places to go to look at what would be built, the kinds of things that would be built. We went immediately after that meeting, we went and looked at those. What we saw were long, rectangular buildings, grade, no personality, nothing like it says in page 115 of the Shape Sioux Falls, 40, 2040, encourage multifamily buildings to be designed to reduce their apparent scale, encourage them to have features such as bays, insets, porticos, porches or stoops to add to scale and character. It did not look at all like our development, the character of our development, okay? Um, also, you know, they had no landscaping, no buffer, no anything. Again, that's very contrary to what that area that has been there for 50 years looks like. Um, so, those are very different uses for that neighborhood. The other thing is, and not necessarily that everyone in the neighborhood agrees, but if the city council feels that they need to have a section of it be live work, one of the alternatives I brought up at that meeting was that in the plan, there is a library building somewhere in the vicinity, if you extend Bingham down to about 45th to 49th, this future plans for a library building. That 11 acre lot at the corner would be a good location to put a library building there instead of farther down, especially since there's a Sioux Falls Middle School being built that should open this fall, just down the street on 41st, and there's also the Brandon Sparta Elementary School. So that would make sense, be a good use for that, not as high intensity of traffic and all that. So that's something to think about. I did ask Shannon about it, and um, the city has not bought land, but I could easily see that maybe you do a trade with a developer and for some future land somewhere. I don't know. That's up to what you guys normally do, but I do think that, again, single family is the way we want to go in our neighborhood to make it match the neighborhood, and again, provide opportunities for lots of people to have entry-level homes. But if you do feel you need to put something there, that would be a good option. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rosa. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Come on up. Good evening, sir. Good evening. My name is Ken Durr. I live on uh, 38th Street in the Pine Hills Edition. Uh, like my neighbors, I am concerned about the RD2 and LW portions of that zoning. Uh, I also feel that turning that entire 50-acre area into single-family homes would be the 
best use of that land. Um, I also want to dispute the idea that 41st is, a, uh, is an arterial. I mean, as mentioned before, that uh, there's that youth area down there, there's the river down there, there's lots of wildlife down there. In the nine years I've lived in the neighborhood, I've seen great horned owls in my trees, I've seen coyotes in my backyard, I've seen deer wandering through. The amount of scat I have to clean up every spring from the deer is pretty amazing. Um, what else? Uh, I, uh, you know, my family, we moved out there nine years ago, and uh, what drew us to that area was the fact that it was absurdly quiet. It's absurdly dark at night. Stargazing for an astronomy class for my kids was fantastic. Um, I think that uh, developing that land outside of a residential area is going to bring an awful lot of noise and light that's going to move the wildlife away and it's going to uh, make stargazing more difficult. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ken. Anyone else here to speak on this tonight? Come on up. Good evening, sir. My name is Warren Oakland. I live at 3205 South Keith Lane. I will be brief. I believe the consensus that you've gathered from us tonight, from all the neighbors, is we are not in favor of the live work RD2 area. I guess I would implore you to eliminate that or at least change it to the very southeast corner of that lot, or of that 50 acres, which, which would make more sense. And I think it would make us a little more happy uh, in the long run. Uh, the RD2 and the live work is not a good spot for that area. Uh, we've lived there for, I've lived there since 1980. I built my house in 1980. I love the area. Uh, and as the other gentleman just, just mentioned, the wildlife that we see, uh, I, I see bald eagles flying over my house. That's going to all go away if you develop this into the live work and everything else that they want to do. Single family dwellings, uh, I think we could live with that and we'd all be happy with it. But the, L, or the live work and RD2, we would appreciate it if you'd change it or eliminate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak tonight on this? Come on up, man. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Joe Eggie, I live at 8801 East 38th Street. Uh, that's to the north and quite a ways down to the east. Um, I do want to say they, they've pretty much covered all the bases. Last thing I want to touch on is the safety factor, and as they brought up, the arterial road at 41st Street and the roller coaster hill. Um, no matter what you have, you're going to have increased traffic, not just on the asphalt, but down the gravel roads as well. Uh, the other thing that I caught, I was at this neighborhood meeting very briefly, that 41st and 6 Mile is going to remain a four-way stop, no lighted intersection. And then the developer went on to say that oh, a lot of these houses are going to be uh, newer family houses, young kids. Uh, one concern we had was high schoolers driving to Brandon down 41st Street, down to the river, you know, flying down that. We all know how a high schooler drives. So, uh, so he's saying we're going to have elementary school, uh, elementary school students, excuse me. Uh, with its elementary school to the west of six mile road uh it raises concern in my mind having those kids they're too close for a bus to pick them up if they're going to be walking to school or even parents walking them to school on an uncontrolled intersection like that no crosswalks no lights uh, and then then we're back to the gravel road people going 55 60 mile an hour down a gravel road so there is a few other safety factors i think that need to be put in consideration with this as well but as my neighbor said too, we love where we live. We want to keep it that way. We understand development, but we don't want to lose the love and the feeling that we have for our development. 
Thank you. Thanks, Joe. All right, anyone else here to speak tonight on this? All right, last call on that. All right. Then we will uh, move on to questions that the council might have, either for Jason, Shannon, applicants here, um, questions, council. Who wants to start? Councilor Starr? Yes, thank you. Mr. Bieber, if I could. One of the, the big concerns we heard tonight and we've heard through the communication with the council is really the, the live work area and the, the commercial concept of that. I know the applicant had said during the meeting, or at least it was said tonight, that it might be in three to four years. What if we left that ag like it is? Would that derail the whole plan? Well, uh, just to kind of maybe talk a little bit about the live work area, I heard some uses that aren't actually allowed in there. So live work allows right. apartments, office, that's it. Um, it doesn't allow retail, it doesn't allow restaurants, bars, um, auto sales, auto repair, any of that kind of uses. Um, when you're doing a development like this, like what we've talked about with Shape Places and Shape Sioux Falls is zoning matters. So when somebody buys that single family house, let's say he starts constructing those single family houses, it'd be good for them to know what this is zoned, I guess, in my opinion. What can it be? What is it zoned for when he's selling those houses? Um, if you look at the live work, I know I've, uh, Brady has indicated, and like he said, it's a couple years off, but his plan, if it was gonna go right now, was to put about 100 units on there. If you look, take 100 units by 11 and a half acres, that's over 5,000 square feet per, per unit. Um, a single family house, minimum lot size in Sioux Falls is 5,000 square feet. So if you look at that, it's not that dense of an apartment complex. Um, it's more of a townhome style thing. However, they're rentals, so we have to classify them as apartment complex. Um, so it, it's really not that dense of an area, I guess. Would be my... my only concern with that, that that's, that's what we hear when we do the zoning change. But once we change the zoning, then the council's taken out, mm -hmm. the neighbors are taken out of that process. And that's where my concern is. We can talk about a lot of things tonight, but tonight all we're doing is changing the zoning and there's potential. It could be more dense than that. I, I balance, you know, we've had a lot of these lately where we, the neighbors thought they understood the zoning and what was coming next to them. And we've had to do, go back and do some re-education. And I think I would feel more comfortable in this situation making the zoning change once we know how it's gonna develop. If the applicant was here saying that that's the plan that he's starting to build this summer, this fall, whatever, not three to four years when the market changes come or what, what's acceptable when they are ready to build. They may need to make it more dense to make the numbers work. You know, we hear that in not necessarily this, but we hear it in a lot of cases and, and changes because all we're doing tonight is just the zoning. and and we think we know what's gonna happen three years ago. We thought we knew what was gonna happen a year and a half ago and look at the way the last year and a half's changed. So anyway, that, it, but it would be possible to amend it out and leave it, this part of it, or would it take a separate application, I guess? And that's probably not as much of a question for you as maybe the city attorney, if that's something we chose to do, so. Sure, and, uh, and I get your point on that aspect. I guess when, when us as a staff are looking at it, we're looking at his plan and basing it on that comprehensive plan. You know, when Brady brings that in, we look at it and say, yeah, it meets all the criteria of our comprehensive plan. You know, we would support C2 commercial in that district um, according to the 2040 plan. So that's really what we're looking at from a, from a, a planning staff perspective. So No, I'm just trying to balance mm -hmm. what, what's happened in the past, what we see happen. You know, we make the zoning change and then the plan's not there. And so to me, sometimes the really changing what the zoning is once we know what it's going to be and we get another bite at the apple to say that's acceptable to the neighborhood or they pitch the idea of what it is. Now we're just pitching a concept that might happen three to four years from now. So I get the balancing of understanding what's going in the neighborhood if I had a, was mm -hmm. buying one of the single family houses too. So, I mean, it's not, it's a partially a chicken versus egg. What do you do first? Do you change the zoning and then allow the uses and it takes us out, it takes the neighborhood out. Um, and just to do it, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Okay. okay, thank you, Councillor. Other questions for Jason? Uh, Councillor Sale, go ahead. Yes, this is more for traffic. Uh, could you address some of the concerns we've heard tonight about traffic in the area and what you found? 
Certainly. Good evening, Shannon Austin, Public Works. Um, so right now, 41st Street carries about 125 vehicles, and that's in a 24-hour period. 41st Street carries about that same amount. So our traffic volumes on 6 Mile as well as 41st Street are pretty comparable today. So in the future, um, 6 Mile Road will extend south of 57th Street, and 41st Street will extend down to Riverview Road and then over to Arrowhead Parkway. So both, both streets are section line arterial streets. Certainly understand today they don't act like that. They're, they're what we call arterials in transition, which are gravel roads and then eventually getting into, into paved surfaces. And so from the city standpoint, we typically, we wait until there is development to development interest to program a project uh, make those grading and utility improvements and then ultimately pave. A perfect example is down on 57th Street uh, from Veterans Parkway over to Six Mile Road, which is south of here. We had programmed 57th Street um, probably three or four CIP programs ago. We put 57th Street in that fifth year. We continued to work with developers and adjacent property owners on when they were going to develop. And as it continuously gets closer to the year of construction, which is starting construction this year, then development occurs. So this, this area certainly is ripe for development. I certainly understand the concerns from the neighborhood because these urban fringes, they're tough. I mean, we have them on all over the area. And so um, the traffic control that we have at 41st and 6th Mile, because of the volumes, can handle, that four-way stop can handle the volumes. Certainly understand once we get pavement from Six Mile Road from 41st Street down to 57th Street, those volumes will increase and we will closely monitor that. Um, brings up a great point, the neighbors bring up a great point regarding the school. Um, what we will do at the next phase, if the preliminary plan and zoning gets approved, we will work with the developers to get that sidewalk from their neighborhood out on Six Mile up to 41st Street, and then currently right now there is already sidewalks on both sides of the, or at least on the south side of the street, to get over to the schools. And so we would, we will create that safe route to school at that, that the next phase, which is the development engineering plan. So we still have a lot of work to do with the developer, um, but this is, from what we see on a traffic standpoint, it's, it's not an overabundance amount of traffic today. Councilor Shale, go ahead. One follow-up question on that. that I was out in the neighborhood this last week and then drove down 41st Street on out. Uh, it's tough to call it a street. It's 41st, gravel road, very washboard, and very hilly. And if the in the 2040 transportation plan, I understand it's, it's scheduled to be paved. That's a very dangerous road going out that way with the hills and the curves and certainly with the wildlife that's there today. Do you perceive that will be completed by 2040 to be paved all the way around? So currently in our 2045 long range transportation plan that the Sioux Falls MPO approved last November, uh, the portion of 41st Street is shown in our tier three uh, of street improvements. And that tier three is anywhere from 16 to 25 years out. And so from our traffic model, we show that those volumes are gonna be anywhere from you know, that's 7,000 to maybe 12,000 on 41st Street up to Riverview Road. And so certainly, I totally agree, it's, it's a roller coaster. It will be a challenge. I talked to the folks last week and even as early as today regarding, there's a lot of trees that are going to have to come down. Just the grading of 41st Street is going to be a challenge. It's going to be, it's going to be, as an engineer, it's going to be kind of a challenge for us to work with the neighbors to come up with something that will work with the neighborhood as well as move traffic. And so 40, or excuse me, Six Mile Road is actually in a tier two project program, which is anywhere from six years to 15 years. And so that Six Mile Road will be improved sooner than 41st Street in our long range transportation plan. But that all depends on, you know, growth and, and development and certainly can change too. Thank you. All right, additional questions, Council. Councilor Kiley, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I would like uh, Jason Beaver to come back back up. Um, one of the requests that uh, we heard this evening was that uh, the residents of this development be afforded the same considerations as 
residents uh, of the city of Sioux Falls. If this were an infill project further inside the interior of the city of Sioux Falls, would there be a different set of standards applied? Uh, great question. Uh, what we typically do is we actually treat the uh, residential, single family residential outside the city the same as if they were in the city. So if we did this project, say, to the west a little farther, it was in city limits and there was an existing residential subdivision on the north side of 41st as we went into city limits, they would still have the same requirement where there wouldn't be a buffer yard requirement for, for a proposed use as Brady is doing. Uh, we have as an arterial street that is actually satisfies the entire buffer yard requirement because a lot of times those right of ways are between 100 and 120 feet so significant distance between uh the proposed use and then the actual single family uses of the, of that uh to the subdivisions that are adjacent to them so if we look at this plan, plan actually brady's single family on the south side is probably more incompatible than the single family on the north side just because we would have to provide that buffer yard because there's not um, that arterial street. Uh, but that's what Shade Places does is it eliminates those incompatibilities by increasing those landscape standards and those buffer yard standards to kind of separate those uses. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the council? All right, seeing no questions, let's get a motion on the floor on this. Move approval. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Kylie uh, to approve item 13. We'll move into council discussion. Councilor Sale, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I know this area, I've driven out there again this last weekend, and it, it's an area that is kind of special up there on Matt and Bingham, the, the roads up there. The last two years ago when I was out there, they were impassable. And, and I understand that you take care of them yourself, and that's, that's another issue. But knowing that in the future, 41st Street is going to be a paved arterial road that's going to handle a lot of traffic. We've kind of dealt with this a little bit when the wedding event barn went in down around the corner, asked these questions before about how this traffic was going to flow. That's my concern about that going forward. But I'd say at this time, this checks off a lot of the boxes that need to be checked off, certainly with planning and development and for the council we need to have a comprehensive view of what's going to happen not just in the city but outside and around and certainly we know that the city's growing so I'm going to vote to approve this because we it really it, it's just something that has to be done I feel bad for the neighborhood that has happened and I realize why you wanted to live out there and I've tried to years ago tried to buy property out there and never came about but so I'm going to vote to approve it for all of those reasons. All right, thank you, Councilor Sale. Other discussion amongst the council on this item? Councilor Neitzert, go ahead. Sure, just a couple of thoughts. I, I think one thing to point out is um, I, I know some people kind of wonder why, why does an arterial satisfy the buffer yard requirement because obviously it's a road. It doesn't seem, you know, very serene. But um, just for a little understanding, you know, the reason you have buffer yards is you're trying to mitigate negative uses from uses that are that are um, up against each other and typically those things are like light traffic height uh, noise and I, obviously if you think about it um, if you have and it's hard to imagine today but once it's an arterial um, you know you, you're going to have light on the road you're going to have traffic that's going to dwarf whatever traffic is generated by that higher use the height is dissipated because now the use is at least 100 feet away. Uh, and then noise, the road noise just from the road, largely would be more than what the other use is. So that's why we say that it satisfies a buffer yard requirement because it, it just naturally uh, creates, creates a barrier. Um, that, there's, I, I totally understand this. I mean, when I was on the annexation task force and had a chance to go out and visit subdivisions like this, um, they, they were, they, they had their own character and it was just, it, it was really a, a really neat deal. And I totally get why people, why people move there. And I think it's, that's just what we're running into here is you have just a, you know, a collision of, of almost, for lack of a better term, a collision of cultures. You have kind of this nice, you know, kind of country feel for lack of a better term. And, and now the city's starting to come around you. 
Um, as you look at this, I, I know it's hard to envision, but you're talking about two section line roads. I mean, it's like we're almost talking, you know, if I look at what would I put at the corner of two section line roads? I mean, it's like a 41st and TLS road, which right now is exploding, which is out over near I am, where I'm at. And a lot of commercials going up, major multifamily, fairway just went in there. And if I just imagine if I took the fairway and would I put, would I put residential, you know, single family right at that intersection, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. So um, I, I think as a broader policy, I've got to stay consistent with that and, and, and just ask the question, if I can't put something that has more multifamily at intersections like this, where can I put it? So that, that's where I have to keep coming back to. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor. Other discussion, councillors, on this item? Councillor Kiley? Yes, I just, it, it comes down to consistency in, in applying our, our standards and, and using the same set of standards regardless of where the development's taking place. We, faced with, we were faced with a, a project that was not much different than this just this past week. Again, uh, two section line roads, uh, and, it, and it's the logical place for this type of development to go, to go into. Uh, because I wish to remain consistent with applying our standards and not just doing it in hodgepodge uh, fashion, I am going to vote uh, for this, uh, this, this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Final discussion, Council, on this? All right, hearing none, let's uh, take a vote on this item, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? No. Brecky? No. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yeah. All right, that item passes five to two. Move on to item 14, please. Deferred from the meeting of Tuesday, May 4th, 2021, a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls approving the preliminary plan of Tin Kate's edition 13-9-19-2021. There is a pending motion from the meeting of Tuesday, May 5th, 2021. A motion was made by Council Member Neitzert and seconded by Council Member Erickson to approve as amended. Uh, private applicants, Design and Develop Engineering, LLC, Dave Gibbon. Uh, this is the preliminary subdivision plan that goes along with our rezoning that we just heard. Uh, just quickly, it's that 50-acre parcel at the southeast corner of 41st and Six Mile Road. As Shannon had indicated, this is the first step with the subdivision process with the developer. And so we're looking for preliminary lot and block layout. We're looking for preliminary utilities, how they're going to go into the development, and then some preliminary drainage uh, type issues. Um, as we know, after this, then we get into the development engineering plan, and then we would have construction plans, and then actually plat, and then there would be uh, construction of the streets and buildings out there. So be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item tonight? All right, Council, we uh, have a motion, a second on the floor already. So uh, any further discussion on this item here from our last meeting? Not hearing any, so we'll take a vote on the motion to approve as amended. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Kylie? Yeah. All right, that item passes 7 to 0. Councillor Selberg, will you uh, get Councillor Jensen back in the room for us? And then we'll move on to item 15, please. A resolution vacating the alley right-of-way from the south right-of-way line of East 23rd Street to the north right-of-way line of East 24th Street. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Brian Wilcox representing uh, Public Works Engineering. Uh, this item was on the April 13th uh, Council agenda. That's the... Uh, alley vacation requests just south of the Avera uh, main campus. Uh, it's currently uh, developed by the uh, Ronald, McDonald, Ronald McDonald House, which is going to be changing a name to the Kirby, Kirby Family Village. They're proposing to do an expansion project here. 
Um, there are no houses in this block that are affected by this alley vacation. They're going to have 10 foot utility easements are going to be reserved at each end of the alley. Uh, engineering requests your support and approval. All right. Anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item tonight? All right, counselors, you got any questions tonight on this item? Look for a motion, please. Move to approve. Neitzert. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by Neitzert, seconded by Kylie to approve item 15. Any discussion here? All right, hearing none, we'll take a vote on that, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item, please. Item 16, approve the mayor's appointment of Gavin Graverson, water superintendent, as nominee to serve as director, and Nicholas Bourne, civil engineer, PE, to serve as alternate to represent the city of Sioux Falls at official meetings of the Lewis and Clark Regional Water System. Evening, Mark. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, this director position um, representing the city of Sioux Falls in the Lewis and Clark Board very important um, role to meet our uh, daily and future water needs. Uh, the Lewis and Clark Regional Water System has been a great partner and in investment. Uh, the city was one of the four founding members of the 20 members today that was um, uh, inked in, in agreement back in 1990 and has proven to be one of the uh, best long-term decisions our community has made. Um, our membership um, with with Lewis and Clark allows us to tap into the Missouri River and it's been um, an incredible source for our clean drought resistant water supply and and uh, fun fact for you since 2012 when we received our first amount of water from Lewis and Clark um, the Sioux Falls customers have used 29.2 billion gallons of water from Lewis and Clark um, tonight with your permission I'd like to first recognize Trent Lubers for his incredible work as the director uh, to Lewis and Clark for the last seven years. Trent is here tonight. Uh, these have been very important years. And Trent, if you'd uh, raise your hand for us. Uh, recently, Trent announced his plans to retire after 31 years of successful service, necessitating this item tonight. Um, Trent has certainly held several important roles with Public Works, most recently the Utility Operations Administrator which is the key role on the Public Works leadership team as they oversee the landfill, light and power, um, uh, water reclamation, and water. And so with your permission tonight, would you help me recognize Trent Lubers as our outgoing director on Lewis and Clark? I did also mean to say he's also once in a while has the distinct honor of um, and title of C. Yes, which is chief problem solver, and so um, <laughs> thank him for it. He's always in the room when bad things happen. So, <laughs> all right, with a great tenure, we've got a good succession plan with Gavin Graverson as as the director, and Nick Bourne's principal water engineer will be the alternate. Uh, to give you a window for those that uh, don't know Gavin, Gavin's sitting next to uh, Trent. If, uh, Gavin, if you'd raise your hand, be recognized. Uh, Gavin's a proud USD graduate. He's been in the water business since 1989, starting with the city of Beersford. He took a job with the city of Sioux Falls in 1994. He's progressed through a number of roles with uh, the city, starting as a water operator, then moved to a lead operator, ultimately the operations supervisor, and now he's the division uh, superintendent for water. And so with your um, permission, help me elevate Gavin Graverson to be our next director on Lewis and Clark. Thank you. We'd ask for your support. All right. Thanks, Mark. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this item here? All right, Councilor, do you have any questions for, uh, for Mark on this change here? Look for a motion, please. Move approval. Move to approve, Brecky. All right. Motion by Selberg, seconded by Brecky on this item. Uh, any discussion, Council? All right. Hearing none, we'll take a vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. 
All right, that passes eight to zero. Trent, wish you the best, man. Thank you. All right, counselors, are there, is there any new business for us tonight? There is. Uh, other than that, any other new business? All right, seeing or hearing none, we'll move on to general public input. Um, just as a reminder, input during this portion will last no more than three minutes per person, and we'd like to invite anyone up for general public input at this time. Good evening. Greetings. I'm David Zokaitis, and in the news now and again, we hear about Christian family values and Christian politics. So tonight's little discourse is on that subject. First, we start with our federal constitution, because, you know, that's the guiding document of our country. And the First Amendment says that Congress won't make any laws regarding religion. That just means that we are free to practice any religion we want or to not practice any religion. And it also means that we can pray or not pray in government. And it's not a theocracy. That's our constitution. By way of background, we should talk about our society a little bit. We are mostly a Christian nature, evangelical and Catholic mostly, but a good quarter of us is not religious. And there's my reference for those statistics. Political reality is important. We might as well be honest with ourselves. Religion is in our culture. It's in our, it's our, in our politics. The Bible, oh my gosh, ancient work. And some parts are really cool in the Bible. Some parts pretty troubling. There's a couple of uh, troubling verses there down at the tail end, bashing infants on rocks. Troubling, but above that, love your God and your neighbor. What could be better than that? It's really sweet. What about some of these hot topic issues of the day? Abortion, it's not hardly in there. Um, niche sexuality, that's not, Jesus that doesn't even talk about that. And then prostitution, Jesus taught about, taught compassion. He, he didn't talk about fear and division. He's a pretty nice guy. So here's the important part. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, comfort the afflicted, feed the poor, promote love, not strife. Those are real Christian family values. Fear and division? No, not really. Now, we always have to end up with a good landscape. So this is along the bike trail. Um, the picture on the left shows what it might look like if you don't look at life quite the right way. And the picture on the right is what it looks like if you're a little more creative with your uh, sliders on your iPhone. So with that, everybody, have a good evening. Enjoy nature and enjoy those Christian family values. All right, thank you. Anyone else here tonight for general public input? Come on up. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, usually when you see me up here, I'm on crutches, but I am recovering from a very intensive surgery. And... Um, doing my best at healing, and as that I have not been my normal chronic volunteer at everything in life. Um, with that, uh, May is Ehlers-Danlos Awareness Month, and with that, I suffer Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome hypermobility type, which is a defect of the tenacin X protein. It causes all sorts of problems, but since we're all old enough, I'll use the reference of Gumby on a hot day. So, uh, unfortunately, we have people young enough that they no longer, they're like, who's that? So appreciate that. Um, so the reason I'm up here is to go ahead and ask you to push forward with the zoning and other regulations for the medical cannabis. I have about 13 different medications I can get off of by applying patches. And I know several uh, people wanting to get into the dispensary business, entrepreneurs that are looking into the zoning information so that they can look in the, into their business ventures. And I really do ask you to push that forward, not only as a medical advocate in the community, but also someone who's, in, who's clearly invested in the growth of our city. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here for general public input tonight? Please come on up. Come on up, sir. 
Good evening. Good evening. I uh, apologize for my attire. My name is George Hendrickson. Uh, I just kind of came straight from work to no get problem, down here. But uh, my son, uh, Eliah, over there, who's been our entertaining noise factor for the evening, is uh, somebody I've advocated for for, well, his entire life. And he's eight years old now, but very publicly for the last five years. Uh, my son suffers from a, a rare medical condition that is very life-threatening for him. And he is one of the people, one of the children you always would see on the, on the newsreels about uh, the children who have, you know, 300 seizures a day that no medicines actually help them and, and that they call them canna kids, where these, these are the children that respond well to different forms of cannabinoids or medical cannabis. So I'm here tonight also uh, to ask you to please push forward with zoning things because for, for medical cannabis businesses and dispensaries or whatever it is that we're going to have in our city because it's exceedingly important to people like him, for people like me, to be able to have that access, to be able to get him medicine that he's going to need that's going to improve his life. And I want to know that the town that I grew up in, the place that I live, after I've spent years advocating in Pierre, that here is going to be more of a home to my son than what Pierre was going to allow to do over the years. And that now that we have a law passed, that we're going to be accommodating in our city for someone like my son that he can feel free to be able to have, be able to get medicine in this town in the form that he needs it so that his life can be enriched by all of you. That's what we're here for. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Anyone else for public input tonight? Good evening. Good evening. Um, I am not a resident of Sioux Falls. Pull those um, mics up a little bit. You're the, you're the tallest sorry. one we've had tonight. Uh, good evening. So there you go. Uh, council members. Um, I'm not a resident of Sioux Falls. I'm a 13-year member of the cannabis industry. What's um, your name, sir? Jonathan Hunt. Okay, John. Um, I've been in this space for 13 years. It's what I've been doing for 13 full years. Um, I've not left the space. I've worked in seven different states. I've done compliance in four of those states. Uh, I've received the first license in California history for a dispensary. I also received the first license for, in California history for processing. Um, I'm just here more or less to offer uh, my services. I'm not looking to charge for anything. I just want to give you guys all the information you don't have currently. Um, I would encourage you to strongly look at other states that are currently working to understand how they have passed ordinances and how the sky hasn't fallen. Um, Again, my name is Jonathan Hunt. I can give you guys my phone number. I'd happily answer any and all questions openly and fairly and uh, tell you how my experience has been for 13 years in this space. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Anyone else here to speak for public input tonight? All right. Seeing no others, uh, we just need a motion to adjourn us out then. Second, Brecky. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Brecky. We need to do a roll on this one. So we'll read the roll on that, please, Denise. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. We're adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. I want